and a pleasant good day to all our viewers and listeners. Welcome once again to the Information Command Center here at the studios of GIS. Thanks for joining us on NTN, Facebook, or YouTube, as well as our partner stations. It's a brand new week. It's the month of May. And we continue to keep you in the know as far as our national response to COVID-19. We start off today with some not so good news. Having learned from the Chief Medical Officer, Dr. Sharon Belmar George, that on Sunday, May 3rd, St. Lucia recorded its 18th case of COVID-19. We take in this report from the Bureau of Health Education. As of May 2nd, 2020, the World Health Organization reported a total of 3,267,184 confirmed cases of COVID-19 globally with 229,971 deaths. There are now 1,340,591 confirmed cases in the region of the Americas. As of Sunday, May 3rd, 2020, St. Lucia recorded another case of COVID-19, bringing the national total of confirmed cases to 18. A total of 52 samples were tested on Saturday, May 2, 2020. The individual is a 51-year-old male who sought care at one of the respiratory clinics with a dry cough, but none of the other accompanying symptoms of COVID-19. He has no known travel history and we are in the process of investigating the source. The individual is currently in care within our respiratory hospital and is responding well to care. The Ministry of Health's contact tracing team is undertaking the necessary follow-up for the identification and quarantine of contacts of this case. The emergence of cases on the East Coast continues to be of concern to the Ministry of Health as we continue to receive reports of entry through unofficial channels. We continue to strengthen our surveillance in these areas and anticipate the detection of more cases as community testing increases. COVID-19 poses a risk of transmission to every individual irrespective of age, socioeconomic status or gender. However, data from the epidemiological department indicates the existing respiratory clinic services are largely being accessed by females. It is an established trend that men tend to be delayed in their seeking of clinical care, sometimes until the condition has advanced significantly. Our males are important segments of society, especially in their roles of spouses, fathers, breadwinners, leaders, and protectors. And as such, when our men are protective of their health choices, it benefits a large cross-section of our society. We particularly encourage men who may be feeling symptomatic to also seek care early as this can prevent possible complications and allows for achieving better health outcomes. The Ministry of Health notes that data trends for the region of the Americas and more specifically the Caribbean demonstrate continued increases in the number of cases of COVID-19. This should highlight prior statements which we have issued cautioning that we should maintain our level of vigilance as we are still at risk for COVID-19. It is important to monitor one's health and take note of feelings of being unwell, which include a dry cough, fever, sore throat, shortness of breath, body aches, as well as the loss of smell or taste and to seek care in a timely manner. All of these alone or in combination could be indications of COVID-19 infection. Care can be obtained at no cost at any one of our five respiratory clinics island-wide, and if further information is required on this service, the public may call the 311 hotline. The Department of Health and Wellness will continue to provide the public with regular updates on COVID-19. In the interim, we encourage everyone to maintain the recommended hygiene measures. Wash your hands frequently with soap and water. Use an alcohol-based hand sanitizer where soap and water may not be available. Cover your coughs and sneezes and use tissue and throw it in a bin after use. Use a cloth mask when going out in public and do not share these masks with others and wash them daily. Maintain physical distancing protocols at all times. 
Together, through these actions, we shall be able to reduce the threat of COVID-19. So, a total of 18 positive COVID-19 cases being recorded here in St. Lucia. And just to reiterate a very valid point uh, made by the CMO with regards um, the public being asked to report any cases of illegal entry to assist as we continue to intensify our surveillance in the areas where we have persons coming in by boat from other islands due to the lockdown of our borders. Now, speaking of the island's borders being closed, St. Lucia, under its response to COVID-19, maintains the closure of its borders to all passenger vessels at the island's airports and seaports. However, cargo vessels continue to make their way in and out of the island. We also saw a few weeks ago a special flight being allowed in to allow St. Lucia nationals who were stranded at sea to return home and they were immediately placed in quarantine. Additionally, on Saturday, May 2nd, a special JetBlue flight arrived in St. Lucia and allowed clearance by the Ministry of Health to pick up 29 persons stranded in St. Lucia who are from the United States. However, no passengers arrived on this flight. No one disembarked. We are aware that in this day of social media and videos and photos going viral and what have you, that persons will have seen some of these images. But again, I would like to reiterate that no passengers came in on that flight and it was a flight to repatriate U.S. citizens. We also saw over the weekend a flight coming into St. Lucia with test kits for coronavirus. This was a collaboration with the government of the Cayman Islands where St. Lucia supplied them with essential COVID-19 testing supplies components that they were in need of, and in exchange, they supplied St. Lucia with COVID-19 test kits. So we now have some additional COVID-19 test kits, thanks to the government and people of the Cayman Islands, and these arrived here by way of a special Cayman Islands flight on Saturday. Before we take a break, a reminder that May is reading month, and this will be our focus on the program today. We also continue to highlight the many positives coming out of our response to COVID-19. And we will meet a gentleman who has embarked on a drive to provide our students with devices as they engage in continuing the third term learning at home. We'll be right back. Because of how quickly the coronavirus spreads, each new case calls for increased public vigilance. Know what is happening, understand why, and comply. Think of the protocols as war tactics. Personal protection tactics. Keep six feet away from others. Avoid riding the bus, gathering on beaches, in bars, and shops. Public protection tactics. Quarantine yourself if you feel fluish in case you have been exposed. Call 311 or a respiratory clinic for advice. Country tactics. Partial lockdown. Supermarkets, small grocers, pharmacies, and ATMs are accessible before curfew. Total lockdown. Everywhere stays closed 24-7 for a stipulated period. Team tactics. Don't only follow the protocols. Be a protocols police. Let's win this. Together let us win this war. So you shall be a soldier. Together we can beat this corona. And welcome back. As I mentioned earlier, May is reading month, and today in studio with us to talk about this from the Ministry of Education standpoint is Angel Caglin, Curriculum Officer for English Language. And we also have in studio Dr. Venus Cherry, a gentleman who has embarked on a drive to secure much needed devices for our students. Welcome to both of you. Thank you. Thank you. Before I go to Ms. Caglin, let's take in this message on the importance of reading by way of this special video.
once you begin to read for the pure joy and love of it, the whole world opens up to you. One of the messages in that video we just saw there, Ms. Kaglin, um, before we go into the whole aspect of reading, just tell us a little about what your role is as a curriculum officer for English language. As the officer responsible for English language, I would work with um, teachers specifically of English language. That would be all of the primary school teachers in front and primary as well as secondary school teachers of English language and English literature. Mm -hmm. um, my role is primarily to assist teachers in implementing the curriculum. Um, that would also mean revising aspects of the curriculum that may be um, a challenge for teachers. It would also involve providing professional development or supporting any professional development provided to teachers as well. In the event that the curriculum itself needs to be revised, I would have to participate in that as well. And of course, to work with the rest of the team at the curriculum development unit, which is CAMDU, to ensure that where linkages are possible, we would make those, we'd, we'd facilitate those for teachers. Mm -hmm. Two words popped up at me there in what you just said. Um, revise, mm -hmm. revising the curriculum and challenges. Mm -hmm. um, we've constantly been hearing talk about the suitability of the present curriculum and revising the curriculum to make it more suitable to our current state of affairs. Where are we at with regard to revising our current curriculum? Well, one of the things that, one of the descriptions usually associated with curriculum is calling it a living document. Meaning at no point in time will you have a curriculum that is perfect. Mm -hmm. And curriculum has several meanings, but I'm assuming you're talking about our written curriculum. Yes. The one that guides what is taught in schools. There are several things that would influence the design of a curriculum. And that would be what happens with your economy what's needed in the job market, what persons may believe, uh, maybe future trends, and the role of education is to prepare students to be able to meet those needs in the future. At present, we are, there are several things that have happened to contribute to an improvement in the curriculum. One of them has been the introduction of learning standards, mm -hmm. and these are OECS primary learning standards, so they were designed for grades K to six. Those standards are essentially the benchmarks that measure what a student, by the end of the grade, should know and be able to do in those particular subject areas. Mm. Presently, we have four, four main subjects, English, math, social studies, and science. We also have, um, the OECS also has introduced a, an assessment framework that guides what assessment should look like in the classroom. So that's formative assessment. We do have, on a ministry level, plans to revise the curriculum itself. And, mm -hmm. of course, that would be a major revision to the curriculum. S um, and, of course, you know, we've been thinking about what direction, should, what direction should be taken when it comes to revising that curriculum. And, clearly, the events that are happening now provides us with even more um, information or more perspective mm -hmm. on what that revised curriculum should look like. Because mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I think one of the points you were making before we came on air that we cannot go back to normal after COVID because you have kids learning a certain way now at home and then to go back to the regular classroom format or what have you might be the new challenge for them. Yes. The, and there are several reasons why we should not be thinking about going back to normal. Um, this crisis has shown us what some of our gaps have been, but more important, it has provided us with so many opportunities. And hopefully all of us as educators um, and as parents and as other interested persons should see and really um, see how we can begin addressing mm -hmm. or seizing those opportunities. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and that's kind of where Reading Month got its whole, this new Reading Month got its whole birth from mm -hmm. um, because we're seeing places where our teachers may not have been before in terms of managing information technology to teach students to support students that is now happening we're not saying it's happening you know at the same level because we have to respect the differences in circumstances and abilities that students have that parents have that educators have mm. Um, so that's one aspect of it. We also have 
what are we what should go into that curriculum you know there's been a major question of whose knowledge is of most worth that ancient question mm -hmm. and really that knowledge whatever knowledge is most important changes depending on the circumstances in a country and um, the circumstances globally so now we have opportunities to start thinking about really what should our curriculum look like in the event that we have a disaster or an event that unlike any other by the way which allows people to come together this one is actually forcing persons to be apart mm -hmm. right so now we can begin to think about what do we do in in that event how do we ensure that things like independent learning and critical thinking are part are embedded in the curriculum and, and really embedded in the strategies that we use to teach students mm -hmm. You made another very valid point before we came on air, and I found it very interesting. The way you differentiated um, between homeschooling as opposed to learning from home. Just go over some of what we discussed earlier. Right. So many, many persons may, they're, they're saying online, you know, um, homeschooling starts today. And technically homeschooling, you need to know the curriculum. Mm -hmm. You need to know what should be taught to a child. You need to know what content, what skills, what attitudes they need to develop. And uh, as far as I know, in most places, you need permission from the education authority mm -hmm. to homeschool your children. Mm -hmm. But learning from home is different. We're not expecting parents to be teachers. We're not mm -hmm. expecting parents to be aware of the curriculum for English, for math, for science, etc. But education does not happen only in a school building. Learning happens everywhere. Mm -hmm. And with, that is why we have lifelong learners. So learning from home is different. Learning from home is, let's see how we can use a combination of teacher support in whatever way it may come. It may be online for some. It may be through educational packages that come to the home. That, that supports the formal learning curriculum. But we also have a lot of learning that can happen in the home when you're cooking when you're designing, maybe redesigning a recipe, when you're doing gardening, when you're sorting clothes, any of these activities teach students, or teach children very, va very valuable skills, but it also allows them to link it to the formal curriculum and the content that they may be learning there. Mm -hmm. I got you. Specific now to Reading Month, what is the Ministry of Education's overall message where Reading Month is concerned? Well, I mentioned two things earlier. One is independent learning and the other is critical thinking. Due to this present situation, um, students are now, a lot of them may be working on their own um, with support from their teacher and their parents in whatever way possible. However, we, we should ask ourselves now, you know, have we really prepared students to be independent learners and to take control of their learning, um, manage their time in a way that, you know, they, they do what they, what they need to do in terms of getting their formal curriculum um, advanced or getting work done. Um, but also, that's not what independent learning is. It's also using natural, natural inclinations of children. For instance, very young children have nat a natural curiosity. Why is the sky blue? Why does this animal fly? Why does it have six legs? We can use these things, these natural curiosities, to help children learn. Mm -hmm. And it's kind of using the child as a starting point for deciding, you know, what information we're going to get. For all the children, after a while, they want to do things on their own. You know, they want to dress themselves. They want to make their own decisions. We can think about our teenagers. You know, they want to decide for themselves. We can use that desire for independence to also help them also help mm -hmm. them learn what is in the formal curriculum but overall we want our t our students our learners to develop an attitude where if i want to know something i know how to go and get that information so our role as educators is not the carrier of knowledge right but we, we're facilitating so if you're curious about something how do you go about getting the information what media, what platforms do you use? How do you, how do you make sure that you're finding what you want to find? How do you not get distracted? You know, how mm. do you see a project from beginning to the end? So that's one aspect of it. Mm. The other aspect has to do with the amount of information that we've gotten from March until now. If we have to compile all of that information, 
you know it might take up a database we've gotten information from from news stations from radio from television online through whatsapp and the question is what do we do with all of that information how do we manage that information so critical thinking is saying we have two sets of questions to ask we need to question the information that we get so, so you get a message saying drink warm water and it will kill the virus okay, or drink alcohol and it will kill the virus so you start questioning that information what's the source of that information is that an authority and if that's an authority what is the bias that this authority may have that prompted them to present the information in this way mm -hmm. right even after you've questioned the content you begin to question yourself how did i feel when i read this this information right do i want to share this you know even if it's true should i share it what kind of effect will it have on someone when they read this do i want to create more panic mm -hmm. you know do i want to contribute to that so should i share it so critical thinking is saying that we should question this information but go a little further create mm -hmm. information as well create content that is positive that is useful so it's against this backdrop that we're looking at this reading month um, which is very special because it's at home mm. you know where reading should be where learning should be um, we're looking at readers as independent learners and critical thinkers and that's our our theme for the month mm -hmm. given that like you mentioned persons are at home practicing social distancing and students are now having to be engaged at home how do you envision the output or the outcome of your program first of all just tell me about the program that you had planned for the month of may or reading month is concerned well one of the things we want people to see is that reading you know in the school environment reading has a goal and that goal is we like to say comprehension and usually any student will tell you when they read they're supposed to either answer some questions or write something or react in some way but why not just read for to satisfy yourself right why not read to satisfy your own curiosity why not read to distress why not read just to enjoy but it, we also want to put reading in context so like i said before as educators we may just repeat the end goal of reading is comprehension but as we were talking before the end goal of reading is not necessarily comprehension it's to be able to use this information in some way to build our new meaning or new understanding for ourselves or even to build new content now with that in mind imagine this happening at home so it's not about something that you do because the teacher requires you to do it or because you know you have to hand in something you're doing this because it's just part of life and part of learning so the calendar of activities that we came up with reflects the varying circumstances that we have among teachers among students among families we have persons with different abilities different interests um, it also it also considers offline and online activities we have to respect people's circumstances there are activities that you can do individually the activities you can do collaboratively so some quick examples um, a word challenge you decide today i am only going to use 20 words you you select those 20 words beforehand and in speaking with anyone responding to any questions you use just those 20 words so you're challenging yourself now to be more aware of how words can be used in different mm -hmm. ways um, a collaborative activity for families is something we have called story wording where you have one member of the family begins the story the next person adds on to it mm -hmm. right all of this is learning but it's in context and it's very non-threatening you have family movie nights there are a lot of there are many movies based on books so you read the book you watch the movie you compare the two mm -hmm. right we're even trying to get um you know we try to make sure that we're actually doing things that students are interested in so you know those TikTok challenges right <laughs> so we're going to put one out there right we have this don't rush challenge you know 
you come looking all you know i woke up like this and then you have your brush and you touch the screen and wow you're looking fabulous mm -hmm. so let's twist that and do something with reading you know you're reading your book yes. and then you touch your book to the screen and you come back and you're a character in, in your in the book that you're reading sounds like fun right sounds like fun. <laughs> yeah we've even we've gone as far as trying to get some of our local persons um there's a young man called donathan from i think he's from sufre he did this really nice music video you know on COVID 19 stay home so on so he's putting something together and he's very um, popular on social media yes <laughs> yes and the, the fact is these are the things that our learners would be interested in these are the things mm -hmm. that they follow so if we want them to get the message we have to use the, the means that they're using we can't decide that well they have to know these things so we're going to force them to learn it our way mm -hmm. you know so we're the old-fashioned way or the, the old, old normal that's right so these are just some of them we actually have an activity for each day the mm -hmm. calendar will be it's already posted on camdu's website um mm -hmm. it's available on a few facebook pages and it will be up on the education um sites as well so okay. there's actually an activity that you can take on for each day mm -hmm. and most definitely we will be sharing that calendar with our viewers on ntn we do for another break and we'll be back to continue the conversation when we come back from the break we'll bring in our other guests as well um we take a break now these are my new superheroes that's why they're all wearing masks doing everything they can to keep everyone in saint lucia safe you don't think we know who you are but we see you every single day you are my friend's dad, my uncle, my father, my best friend's mom, my aunt, and the guy next door. You are the best of all of us, working together to save the world. Not all superheroes get to wear capes, but you might have noticed they're all wearing masks. So, be a hero and wear one too. Stay safe, your Digicel family. And welcome back. Before we bring in our other guests with the conversation on Reading Month, as well as we're going to discuss a special laptop or device program for students in need, we now take in a video looking at what Elon Musk, the CEO of SpaceX, as well as co-founder of Tesla Inc., has to say about reading. I like biographies in general. Um, biographies, I think, are really, you know, really interesting read. Um, what you learn from them? Well, I think you learn a lot, depending upon you know whose life you're reading about. Um, there, there are lots of lessons in there. I read Isaacson's biography of Jobs, which I thought was quite interesting, and I actually really liked um, his biography of Benjamin Franklin, uh, who, who I would say is certainly one of my heroes. He seemed like a really great guy. And you, you actually managed to incorporate any of this into your own strategy, your own way of doing business, your own ethos and philosophy? Well, I think in the case of Franklin, he did what needed to be done at the time it needed to be done. So, you know, he was in different fields and, and um, he sort of thought about, okay, what's the important thing that needs to be accomplished right now and then worked on that. Are you an online, on tablet, a Kindle, or a crinkle of the paper? There is something romantic about traditional books, of course, um, but I find uh, since I'm traveling so much and, and um, I, that, that, that I often find I'm reading the books on my iPhone, uh, which may sound like, wow, this is really tiny, but uh, pass, it's always pass, with pass you. Pass me my iPhone. <laughs> pass me. I mean, you're not reading the Howard Hughes book on your iPhone. Yes, I am. Yeah. You're reading a Howard Hughes book on something the size of this? Yes. <laughs> it's, it's, it's small, but uh, it works. I'll, I'll tell you honestly the book the book I'm reading, uh, which I was sort of thinking should I say this or not, but um, it's a, it's a uh, book on Howard Hughes, um, <laughs> which um, you know uh, maybe a cautionary tale. I mean, he's sort of an interesting fellow. Um, def definitely want to make sure I don't uh, grow my fingernails too long and start peeing in jars. But, but <laughs> you beat me to the line. <laughs> I was just about to right. say, why how to choose? What is it about him that you found interesting? And I, I've just been meaning to read a book about him for ages, and I, I haven't. And so I'm broadly aware of, of, of his sort of the things he's done. And um, I saw the movie The Aviator, and you know, and 
a few, a few other things. Interesting comments there um, coming from Elon Musk, especially talking about um, the romantic allegiance to traditional books. I'll turn my attention now to Dr. Cherry before we talk about your project. Um, how important do you think it is to have that engagement of traditional books, keeping libraries, etc., while pressing ahead with e-learning, creating that balance? I mean, but one thing that's always important in life is to preserve history. Um, we've had the discussion previously in what's going on with some of the buildings here in St. Lucia, and you heard the debate as to whether or not a building should come down or why it should stay up and the cost effect. But I think we all love history. When we travel, we go to museums, we go to different places to, you know, partake and be part of history. So I think it's very important. I think the idea of going in, and I remember growing up in Grosile, and you had to be quiet at the library, and you took a library book, you had a week to read it and bring it back, and what the penalties were and so forth. I think that's important because I think it's something not only just preserving history, but preserving a way of life. It's something that we do, we've done traditionally, and despite the fact that, you know, with e-books and stuff of that nature, it helps a lot of people get access to a lot more books um, very conveniently. We still have to focus on those that can't afford those devices, mm -hmm. and we still need the library where they can go in, and anyone can register, sign up, and get a book to read, because we know as we will find out later on in the show why I'm here, mm -hmm. not everyone mm -hmm. can afford a device okay. of that As nature. we said, we'll find out why you're here, but <laughs> also we need to know for our benefit our listeners, our viewers, exactly who you are. So tell us a little about yourself. Um, so my name is Venus Cherry. I'm originally from Grosley, born and raised. Um, currently reside in the U.S. and work for University of Penn and Penn Medicine as um, the senior instructional designer on the IS education team. Um, did my schooling in Grosley Primary. My favorite school on the island is no longer here, but Rock Hall Senior Primary. <laughs> um, I cast this comprehensive uh, for some schooling in Cuba and then Bloomsburg University of Pennsylvania and Drexel in Philadelphia. So I'm here on vacation, and some will say I got stuck because of COVID-19, but can you really be You're stuck? Not disappointed. Can you really be <laughs> stuck at home? You know, you can't really be stuck at home. So I am, I am very happy to be able to be to be here and the amazing thing is everything is when we transition into what and why I'm here I'm here and I'm still working I'm mm -hmm. working from home mm -hmm. uh, my entire team in Philadelphia is working from home right now um, they're scheduled to be back in the office on June 2nd I won't be joining them <laughs> yet, I don't think um, but we can see the importance of technology and the importance of computers and so forth and how we're moving forward in the future and so maybe it took COVID-19 to have our kids now having to stay at home and teachers, because some teachers are not technolog technology savvy as well. And so it's a learning experience for everyone. Yes. So um, that's a little about me. I'm born and raised in St. Lucia, and I really love my country. I really love my island. And if I was going to get stuck anywhere in the world, I'm glad it's here. It's here in St. Yeah. Lucia. Let's tell us now about the whole concept um, the laptop devices, um, securing devices for children in need. How did that come about? Um, this came about just me being who I am. Me um, remembering my history, growing up in a single parent family of seven of us, and mom not really having enough to send us to school and to take care of us. And I went to Grosley Primary, and I remember at the time it was like maybe 25 cents to pay transportation, and she didn't have that. We couldn't afford that. and you know, sometimes me selling coconuts and mangoes, that only put food on the table that didn't give enough, you know, for us to go to school. And fortunately for me, some bus drivers would, you know, be kind enough to give me a ride. Even when the bus was full, they'd put you to sit in mm -hmm. the back of the drive on the little yes. thing where we always thought that's where the engine was because it was always so hot. So hot, yes. But, you know, I'd rather do that, sit there for 15 minutes than have to walk for hours, you know, to Marisil and then to Grosile. So for me being back home, seeing how you know my life has blossomed and the only reason my life is what it is is because people in my community took an interest in me early on you know as a kid growing up and teachers would say you know he's a smart kid I just wish he came to school a little more mm -hmm. and you know people heard that and at some point in time you know people take an interest and 
fortunately for me, when I left um, Rock Hall and at, um, started Cassius Comprehensive, teacher Alicia from um, Grosley Primary, may she rest in peace, she approached Courts and um, Cable and Wireless at the time to see if she can get a scholarship for me, which I did. So that gave me an opportunity to be able to go to school and have proper uniform and proper shoes and no more Chinese shoes for me at that <laughs> point. Because sometimes when my mom didn't get the male Chinese shoes, she would surely buy the female ones and <laughs> you'd have to wear that to go to school. So it's like I always remembered like where I came from and the reason why I'm able to have my doctorate and, 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 and able to work and have a beautiful job and able to take care of my families because people saw something in me and people gave me an opportunity to be able to get a proper education. So for me, that's very important. So when the whole COVID-19 and the ministry announced that school was, school was gonna commence and but it was gonna be stay at home, in, immediately my mind went on all those people I know in my district of Grosely who can't afford a tablet or, or computer of any sort. And it's like, what can I do? And, I could probably buy a few on my own, but you know, that, that's not very effective. So, you know, I came up with the idea, maybe people are willing to help. And so, created a GoFundMe page, and man, it's been amazing. People are really willing to help. Um, if it's one thing this COVID-19 has showed me is that we have loving, caring people out there. No matter what you hear about St. Lucia, and we'll split up red and white or whatever, in this initiative, no one has cared if I was yellow or red or who the students would be. Everyone has come on board and so many people have been contributing tremendously. I have pledges from the shop box. I have pledges from Darren Sami. Mm -hmm. I have I've joined forces with Dr. Jimmy Fletcher and um, Dr. Stephen King, um, Rice and Lucia. So mm -hmm. we're combining our GoFundMe's to maximize the amount of devices we can buy. Um, the sale have come on board and offered us a great deal. They're providing the devices not just at a reasonable price, but they're also providing the SIM cards to go in the devices, and they're also providing 100 gigabytes of data on there. So students who are in areas where they don't have internet connection, they don't have Wi-Fi, they still have the data so they can connect to the teachers. And the reasons why we're getting a device that can also take a SIM card, in case there's a question you have for the teacher, Mm. You can call Miss, Miss can call you, right. you can have that dialogue. So I just figured it's something that, you know, I could do to help out, but by all means, the credit is not for me. The credit is for all those people out there from all over the world who's contributed to the GoFundMe. Um, the GoFundMe is currently at over 7,000 US dollars. What is your goal? What is your target? Um, I don't know, to be honest, because I'll tell you why. T in order to build a database of need. I reached out on Facebook and I posted to the principals and teachers of the secondary and primary schools on the island to hit me up and let me know of students in need. And currently, the list I have is at 620 households. And I say households and not students because I want to explain that. The criteria set for the principals and teachers was to give me the names of students just one child per household. So even if there are three students in the household, I only wanted one name because I wanted to ensure that I only give one device per household so as to maximize the amount of households we got mm -hmm. to. So the 620 household doesn't truly show how many students are in need. It's just a small number. And that's from schools from all over the island. So I don't really have an end goal unless the end goal really is to provide 620 devices. Mm -hmm. um, that's a tall order, but the information I collected was the name of the students, the um, school, the grade, the parents' information, and address. The reason I collected all of that is when, we build my, when I build the spreadsheet, I want to be able to say, okay, so we have 620. We only have 100 devices. Let's divide that evenly so that every single district mm -hmm. gets a bit of love. Okay. I don't want to prioritize and say I'm from Grosile, so I'm giving Grosile 20 and I'm only giving 10 to Ancillary. No. I want to be able to say that these funds were raised by people from all over, and the goal was to help as many kids as possible, all of St. Lucia. And so that's, that's the goal. That's what we're hoping to, to accomplish 
at the end of this. So my end goal really is to raise enough to buy 620 devices or more. Mm -hmm. So Besides the GoFundMe, um, I'm sure there are persons who are probably willing to donate or contribute. How do persons get in touch with you? How do they so contact you? I have placed my personal phone number on Facebook and so I have 9 billion calls. Don't get <laughs> mad if I change numbers after this is all over. But people can reach me at um, 1-302-598-5712 on WhatsApp. Um, I can also be reached at the local number provided to me by the cell um, at 724-4177. Um, people have reached out in many ways. I've had individuals who had laptops at home in Viewfort, cleaned it out, sent it up to me. People who have went out and bought um, devices themselves and handed it to me. People have called me and say, hey, meet me by this gas station or by the mall and handed me $20, handed me 250 US dollars, all different amounts. So mm -hmm. in any way you can reach me, if you say you have five bucks and you're in castries, I will be there because we need all the help we can get in order to raise those funds to get to those kids as quickly as possible because we're going into, come next week, we're going to like the fourth week of school. And some stu students still don't have devices. I spoke to a teacher today from Castro's Comprehensive who's working with students who are getting ready to prepare the SBAs. And they had a class set up today. And out of 16 students, only six could attend. You know, mm -hmm. so the need is great. And um, it's, it's good to see that in this, in this pandemic crisis when people are saving every penny for tomorrow because so many people are laid off, so many people don't know if they'll have a job tomorrow. People are still finding a way to contribute to the need of, of, of what is, and in fact, our future generations, the future mm -hmm. of St. Lucia. So. You, you heard earlier on some of the discussion about reading. Share your thoughts on creating the right balance for students, e-education, use of technology, and creating a curriculum that makes allowances for various aptitudes. Well, it's not even just about the students. It's also about the teachers. Mm -hmm. But we keep that the one group that I think most times we're forgetting is the parents. We have population in St. Lucia where a lot of parents are, sad to say, not really educated. I know I grew up in a household that way. So it's like if I came home with an assignment and I didn't know the answer, I was stuck. I was the eldest in my family and it was just a single parent family. If I didn't know it, no one else did, you know? So it's like, it's a matter of the balance just have to be, like with this happening now and we're just saying, like um, learn from home or virtual learning. And it's like, where is the guidance coming from? Because if the kids don't know it, if they don't know it, who's helping them? And if you can't reach a teacher, if you don't have a device, you don't have a cell phone, you can't reach a, te a teacher, how are we getting that? So it's important that not just our students are reading, but it's also important that the parents are reading. And not because you didn't get an education before you became a parent that you stopped trying to learn or you stop trying to educate yourself. If your kids have books at home, if you didn't get an education, read it as well. Mm -hmm. Try to understand it. Try have a dialogue with your child afterwards. What did you get out of this? Right. How can you associate that, associate that with our life or what we're going through? You know? And if there's that back and forth dialogue, you'll be amazed how much more two individuals can learn and how much that child now when they talk to the teacher can be a little more prepared. So it's not just about the gadgets because what we find is I live in the US and these as good as they are, the negatives are we put aside human interaction, we put aside conversations and dialogues, everyone is head down, like you say Facebook, WhatsApp, someone might be right in the same house with you and send you a WhatsApp message to ask you a question as opposed to just come in and have a conversation with you. So there needs to be a balance. It can't just be about technological devices because if you can't read to begin with, it don't matter how I present the stuff to you, whether it be with a book <laughs> or through, a, or through a, 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 an electronic device, you, won't, you just don't know how to read. So I think the focus needs to be not just the kids or the teachers, but also the parents. Mm -hmm. Are we, how, how much data is collected to know like, what is the, the literacy level at home? How much help can those students get? And that's where I think we need to try to strike a balance. Mm -hmm. Ms. Kangling, with Reading Month, will that also be the focus? I know typically Reading Month focus on the students, the schools, but are we going to see some sort of shift or incorporation where you target teachers and parents as well with Reading Month? Well, one of the 
one of the bases for reading month is that we want everyone to participate and you would in the, the calendar you would notice that there are activities for students but there are activities for educators and there are activities that incorporate um, parental involvement um, I really appreciate the comment that you made about parents because this is one of the implications for the future of education we now realize very clearly the importance of the homeschool connection and it's not that we we will necessarily teach parents how to be teachers or even necessarily that we will we will be able to teach everyone how to read or teach everyone how to write we are already struggling to do that with our our students mm -hmm. but what we can do is show how the cultural competence of parents is just as valuable as the academic knowledge that we have and what do i mean by that teach and um, parents who are who are seamstresses or tailors, parents who are into agriculture, parents who are restaurant owners, who are vendors. They all have experiences that are very valuable and that we can link to learning. So those persons who are vendors, they may not have any kind of degree in, in you know, economics or in math. They may not have completed secondary school, but they know how much they're making, they know how much they should make, how are they doing that? Um, for persons who, who may be into um, the design, sewing, etc., how can that skill be translated into what students do? In fact, the, the, the fact is whatever we're teaching students, it's not for the sake of teaching them. It's not for the sake of knowledge. It's to be able to do something. Mm -hmm. So we have to start thinking about, in education, we have to start looking at where is the economy going where is health going where is security going and then we can see okay how do we make adjustments in education so that students can get there so in terms of let's say we're, we're thinking that okay food security is a problem we need to start thinking about agriculture not necessarily for export but for subsistence to survive mm -hmm. Education is important there because now students can begin to see all of that theory I'm learning in agriculture in the school. How does that translate to, you know, a farm that actually works and that actually produces? So being a farmer in the 21st century and going on, it's not necessarily going to the garden with the tools. It could be managing a farm. Mm -hmm. So we're looking at making this more realistic making this more authentic and giving it an actual purpose, not learning for learning sick, but learning to use. Um, the other point is the other future that we're looking at in terms for, of for teachers. We heard the term teacher training a lot. You know, teachers should be trained, but all of the time it's us consuming information that someone else has produced. Mm -hmm. Just as for our students, we want our teachers to be, we want all of us as educators to be content creators, mm -hmm. not just consumers. So every time we're teaching our students in the class and we want a video, we have to go on YouTube and we have to find an American video or a UK video or a video produced somewhere else when it's totally within our capability to produce those videos locally. You know, phones are getting so advanced that, you know, the, the video features on this, yes. they're good enough for you to be, to fool someone that you're a professional. So we can create our own content and actually teachers are doing that now because the way that they're teaching has changed. So there are quite a few things that we have to pay attention to when it comes to the future of education. I think you sort of put me on the spot there, you know, <laughs> having to look for content out of St. Lucia for <laughs> this program today, but that's okay. Um, let me just bring the whole aspect of the career language. Mm. A barrier or an asset to be used to our advantage? I want both of you to comment mm -hmm. on that. Mm -hmm. Ladies first. Kweol lasian lang. Uka sevi kweol pu komunike epimun. That is how we. That is how. Okay. Pani problem. Si du vle an bagay, ou made pouli, an kweol, ou made pouli an angle, ou ka ijwen ni. Sa se whole purpose an lang. So, Kweol la, nou pe pasa pale yi. An chay moun pasa pale Kweol la. Yo sa kopon ni, mi yo pasa pale yi. Mim sou pasa pale yi. Lang, anglia ou ka pale. 
c'est sorti en créole là manière nous ka di bay go i go in <laughs> hein aller na aller <laughs> right it obey it fall anglais nous ka parler sorti en créole là c'est pas un problème et puis recherche ka moucho moun ki sa parler pli passé yon lang yo pli intelligent yo mm. sa apprend pli vite et puis pour ces mamay nous espèce pensé pli piti a yo sa apprend toute langue ou mettez devant yo yo sa parler toute mamay sa fait ça son nous ni pour pour chance ça la nous ni pour pour faire ces mamay ça étudier ces langues ça pour faire l'idée yo pli fort son mm. anglais c'est pas anglais tout seul anglais a bon mais Kweo la bon tout. Mm -hmm. Et puis, il y a un chai qui nous dit. Il y a un chai tradition nous. Et puis, parler de un chai uh, tradition qui nous dit pour Chenni. Nous dit pour Chenni vivant. Kweo la pas seulement pour Creole Heritage Month. Mm -hmm. Junior Creole tout seul. Eh bien, si un bagay fait. Gade manye COVID-19, nous n'y a un qui a fait nous toutes nouvelles en Kweo la Bouza. Tout station si pour si pour se faire ça à présent. Des mon kabay nouvelle là, y en anglais, y en a créole. Mm -hmm. Tout teacher nous, nous pas ça, nous pas ça tout ça parler créole là, mais nous ça fait un petit bail. Mm -hmm. Et puis nous ça respecter langage tout monde les venir en classe là. Puis si moi veux comprendre l'autre langue, moi ni pour commencer puis langue là on connaît. Mm -hmm. Et pour un chai mon créole là c'est langue chayo. Et si vous parlez en langue um, tchèmoun, vous pouvez apprendre, vous pouvez comprendre. Mm -hmm. <laughs> wow, tout le monde maintenant. Je ne vais pas faire tout le monde en créole. Mais ce que je peux dire, c'est que j'ai senti des avantages comme un Saint-Louis. Je peux parler créole, je comprends très bien, mais je ne peux pas lire. Et c'est parce que je pense que c'était pas dans les écoles. Et j'ai toujours questionné pourquoi le créole est une grande partie de notre histoire. Sept fois plus britannique, mais aussi sept fois plus français. I don't understand why that's not part of our curriculum. Why we have to learn, we learn Spanish, we learn French, but we don't learn Creole. Is it because we're only preparing our students for the outside world? You go to the outside world and they ask you what other languages you can speak, as if Creole is not one. You know, you have to put Spanish, you put French, and like, oh, okay, you can speak in a, a foreign language. Um, I hated that idea. I think that Creole should be taught to our kids from the very get-go from like infant school just like you learn your ABC in English you learn it in Creole and I remember in some households if you even spoke Creole it was a no-no mm -hmm. it was like you know it was kind of like saying um, if you had dreadlocks you couldn't work in the ministry mm -hmm. you know I mean it's like all this notions of the older folks that they were just or so set man if a doctor is. yes <laughs> and, and, and wearing a cap on television yeah um, it's just it's just certain things that we have to grow out of. I think our Creole, I think, like she said, it's like only during Creole month we really get to enjoy everything that is us, everything that is, although all of our streets and towns and so many places are still named in Creole, but it's not really part of our cur curriculum. Like, so I think that's something the ministry needs to undertake. I think that's mm -hmm. something that needs to be brought into the classrooms, part of our curriculum. Now, if you don't want to have a CXE course for it, that's great, but at least that our students should be taught in that as well. Definitely. We're quickly running out of time, but before we wrap up, just a note from the Ministry of Education. Before we leave, the Ministry of Education is continuing the thrust into e-education by providing devices to teachers and students who do not have access to these modern teaching and learning tools. And so far, over 1,300 devices have been distributed to students and teachers across the island. At this point, we take in some final thoughts from you, Ms. Kagle, and we go over to Mr. Sherry. But before that, maybe included in your final thoughts, since this reading month, you could share with us what are some of your reading material right now, and then uh, your final thoughts. OK. Well, actually, my reading material is kind of strange. I'm reading up on something called cryptocurrency now. Mm. OK. <laughs> Sounded interesting. I have no idea what it is. I have read one and a half books that try to explain it to persons who have very little understanding i think i need to read a couple more books before i can even explain what it is to another person okay. <laughs> um i just just in closing i wanted to just build on something that dr cherry said about quail 
one of our programs, the Early Learners Program, out of that program, we've actually completed the draft of a national language policy that brings the quail into the classroom. Mm. We, we want to get that to cabinet so that it's something that is approved so that we can do that formally. And uh, really and truly, that was supposed to have been the focus of reading month. I Initially, see. it was supposed to be about multilingualism and the fact that we have several languages in St. Lucia. And we wanted to celebrate that for reading month. But of course, we wanted to be responsive to present situation so we did that but there are still opportunities during reading month we actually have a day where you can do um l'histoire mm. creole traditional storytelling as a family okay so we do have we do have those incorporated in there as well and uh, hopefully we can come back sometime and really talk Absolutely. about what's Most happening in education i realize we have so much more that we need so to much discuss. More. so we yes. will have you back um Dr. Sherry, what's on your reading list right now? And final appeal from you with your laptop device program? Wow, my reading list, to be honest with you guys, I haven't had anything on my reading list. Um, with my work and what I do, I produce e-learnings for physicians, nurses, so I always have a whole bunch of content that is new to me that I need to read to understand okay. in order to reproduce. So that's what I've been focusing on because trying to share my time within my eight hours of work and what I'm doing here now. I haven't really picked up a book that wasn't about actual work yes, for yes, now. Understood. But um, I just want to thank everyone, everyone, everyone who has donated to the GoFundMe. We have a long way to go. Like I said, we have 620 households in need. Um, thanks to everyone who's pledged donations so far. Thanks to everyone who's given their hard-earned cash towards that. Thanks to Dr. Jimmy Fletcher and Stephen King for joining in on the GoFundMe for this venture. They, cash, they had to save us for a different purpose, but they realize how important this is. Um, I just want to thank everyone. Those who can, go share, the, go, share, go share the GoFundMe. Donate whatever you can. Like I said, nothing is too small. We need to ensure that the kids are prepared. Because if they're not prepared, we can't just sit and say, oh, they didn't care. Or, oh, they just want to stay on the road all day. Because we're quick to label kids. We're quick to hold kids, I think, a little more accountable than we hold adults. That seems to be St. Lucia's norm nowadays. Mm -hmm. He's a minister, he's this, he's that. Oh, give the guy a break. But when it's a kid, oh, those, that generation, these kids nowadays, well, this is an opportunity for us to show them that we really care. And we can do so by helping them get a device, which is the start they need in order to participate in class. So I want to thank everyone who's contributed so far and thank everyone in advance that are going to contribute in the future. And I thank both of you for joining me here today on our National COVID Command Center response. I thank both of you. And um, the information that you put out there was quite valuable. As always, I continue to ask St. Lucia to remain strong, safe, and resilient. And keep in mind that these two shall pass. However, before the passing over, we need to adhere to the protocols and be mindful that we are all in this together. We end with a message from the Barbano Secondary School Build Club and Cut TV. If we are to defeat COVID-19, we the youth should follow the guidelines set by our leaders to stop the spread of this deadly virus. This is not the time to be partying, liming or going to the beach because we can easily become carriers of COVID-19, affecting our community and our loved ones. I know staying at home may be challenging, but there are a few things you can do to make use of your time. Ensure that you use the e-learning platforms provided by respective schools. These platforms will be updated daily with lessons and assignments which you are required to complete. Use this opportunity to get closer to your family. This is the perfect time to impact knowledge or learn better life lessons from the ones we learn. Exercising 30 minutes a day not only improve on your physical fitness but also improve your overall health. This time can also be used to develop a new and exciting skill like cooking. We are all in this fight against COVID-19. So remember, stay home, be productive and active and stay safe.